OK, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, so this is a demo slash uh, release demo uh, that we've combined together. Um, so we had to push it back one week because uh, we were finalizing some of the uh, release stuff, and then we had a bit of an experimentation week last week. Um, so we just thought we can push it a week just to give us a little bit more breathing space. So as you probably already saw on our GitHub project, uh, we released two weeks ago now uh, 0.11.0. Uh, this marks a very significant release for us um, because it includes a lot of refactoring that we've done um, and kind of been working on for the last few months um, where we've been migrating to an active model um, in terms of how we do all of the structure of the code and how the components then interact with each other. So this is very significant for us because it's going to have a very, very positive impact on the speed of development in the future. Um, and it also is a nicer architecture design and it makes it easier to kind of reuse the components and stuff like that and also kind of lay down the structure for the future um, when we start thinking of, you know, combining your own custom components together to make one kind of single binary uh, to do all the functionality you want. That aspect is more for the future, so um, but it's important that we have the groundwork um, down first uh, to enable all of this stuff. So as like any of the release, we have it all on the GitHub um, our project page. Uh, so I would really recommend if you haven't already kind of subscribed to the project to either watch it um, or I think if you star a project, you usually get kind of notifications um, so that you're always informed when there's new releases. So I want to start off with, so there's a lot of, if you look at the release pages, there's um, there's a lot of things that we implemented. So there's a few kind of maybe not so sexy features. Um, so like super user facing features. Um, however, there's a lot of kind of under the hood niceties that kind of um, will, I think, imp uh, very positively influence your experience um, when using Thin Edge. So as you can see here, there was a lot of PRs that got merged. Um, but today I want to focus on a few kind of like highlighted points, um, though some of them are going to be a little bit technical, so or a bit hard to demo. So I'll maybe just kind of explain what the purpose was behind all of this. So as said, the refactoring was the major focus of this re release. Um, so because we're refactoring, we're not imagining that we've done any breaking changes. Um, so all of our integration tests so far, so all of like the public interfaces have not changed. Um, it's just more of the internals, which have then been restructured. We've introduced um, an extension to some of the lock files that we have, that we've added some PID information about the running process, um, because that makes it a little bit easier to integrate with some third party tools. Uh, like Monit, for example, that you can actually track, you know, what is the actual um, PID related to a running service using kind of internal or like um, normal kind of lock file implementations. Then we had a lot of improvements in terms of a using a certificate store, which is the default uh, used by the operating system. Um, for example, so that should be system. I've done too many system D stuff. Um, so we support by default all of the um, CA store, which is configured on the operating system. Um, so this is kind of the standard behavior that you'll get a lot with curl and mosquito sub that it will always use the mosquito, uh, sorry, these operating systems um, CA store. So it makes for a more seamless and it makes it easier to debug if you have CA store issues um, that you can test it with curl and then use it with thin edge and then you can be sure that it kind of behaves as expected. Then a few usability improvements that for the mapper that we've improved the hot reloading or detection of changes, especially to custom operations and the contents. So if you change um, that maybe a custom operation should then point to another script, um, that will be detected automatically. So you don't need to restart the mapper anymore. Uh, so there's a few corner cases where um, you'd need to restart the mapper for this, but this is no longer the case. Then we have support for 
usage of custom domains. So if you're or if you have a customer or you have a um, enterprise tenant and then you have a custom domain, um, there was a mostly a differentiation between the MQTT endpoint and the HTTP endpoints. So ThinEdge needs both to work um, because some of the binary upload API is done through HTTP, not MQTT. Um, so we now support being able to have different URLs um, and it also supports cases. So if you have some kind of custom Nginx setup where your MQTT endpoint is being terminated to a 443 port or something like that, that also supports that use case. Then a kind of bigger one, which is quite technical for users to implement, um, but we now support it. Um, so we support the configuration of using certificates both on the client side. So when connecting to a broker which expects clients to have certificates and also server authentication. Um, so you can set up a CA for the broker so that um, you can set up the trust from the clients when they connect to the broker that they can be assured they're connecting to a broker that they trust. And if you don't have the CA, then it will also the client will reject the connection. So now I must stress that if anyone's played around with the Mosquito settings, it's not the most easiest thing to do. And also if you don't have any kind of infrastructure in place to do the CA creation and all of that kind of stuff, um, it can be a little bit cumbersome. We've added some guides on how to do this if you want to do this, um, but this is really the, the first step. So enabling people to configure their own kind of setup. And then the next step in the future would be look, you know, how could we implement a local PKI to make this kind of device registration process um, locally in the network a lot easier for people. So obviously we can't do one without the other. So this is kind of laying the groundwork for the future work. So before I kind of get into the demos, um, so one technical uh, or another kind of side project that we have is we've built a Tedge demo container project. So I'm going to be using this to show some of the demos, but I really want to highlight how useful this is because this can be used to demo to new customers or use in development, um, or if you just kind of want to, could even integrate it into your own CI pipeline to run integration tests, um, because it allows you to get a, um, a simulated device up and running using a container. So it's a fully fledged system D enabled environment. So it's not say the classic, containerization setup that you would normally have in some kind of production devices. The key for this project was to simulate a real device, so to remove the reliance on hardware, so physical hardware. So you don't need a Raspberry Pi to check everything out. You just basically spin this up and it behaves like a Raspberry Pi, so you can do all of your system D commands on it and journal D and everything. So it's really to quickly get everything up and running and to kind of get a bit better understanding about what FinEdge is and how to extend it and all of that. So I'd like to demo that first. Um, so you can kind of see on the, the page, you know, what's all included. So I basically just copy this from the project page. So we can see here, this is the project. It has a list of all of the features it can do. So configuration management, device reboot, special events, log management, measurements, remote access, et cetera. Um, and to get started, it's actually really easy because we're using a Docker Compose file. So because I want to do something a little bit more interesting, I'm going to do this all live. And I'm going to find myself just to show you how easy it really is. So I'm just going to start off, get the URL for the Docker Compose. So my goal is to have everything up and running within 90 seconds. So let's start the clock. So I'll just do a live demo first. So I'm just creating a folder. I'm going to curl to it. So I've just downloaded the Docker Compose. But because I also want to kind of customize it maybe. So this has two devices at the moment. I'm just going to add a third one. So child devices, I mean, goes up. So it's now started. 
and I'm using a CLI tool, so it kind of plays nicely with the CLI tools. And I'm just bootstrapping it to say, yes, connect to this kind of uh, Comvolocity tenant. Um, it suggested a random ID for me to use. I just press enter because I forgot to. Um, and then it goes through the bootstrapping. So it'll do like the certificate upload automatically. And this is all using kind of the session that I had for the Go say CLI stuff. Uh, but if you don't have any kind of environment variable set, it'll actually prompt you for all of the information. So then you can enter in whatever uh, device ID you want and the tenant. So you can also enter that in manually. But for the kind of the demo situation, you basically want to get everything up and running as fast as possible. Okay, and I'm done. So it gives me a nice URL link that I can go to. And here's my new device. Let's make that a little bit bigger. And so we can see here I have three child devices also set up because part of the edge is showing, hey, you can connect to child devices um, and they can be, you know, act as the gateway for the child devices to communicate with the cloud. Um, we have all of the, the nice features. So we have services, we even have some custom uh, plugins installed for the container, which was demoed in the last uh, community meetup. You can interact with software uh, management, so you can also, because we have system D and it's a fully fledged Debian environment, you can also install all of the Debian packages via APT and the normal kind of mechanism. Everything that you would have done with your Raspberry Pi, you can do here. So we have log file management and we've also installed like the community plugins for the shell. So if I wanted to do just to show that we're really running a, a Debian system, so we're running a Debian 11 bullseye instance. So the idea of this is it has everything in it. So it's really use um, everything's pretty much out of the box. Um, so you can even do, you know, web SSH in there. So it has a default user that I can then connect to my container and everything behaves nicely. Uh, so just give it a sec. And then I'm inside my container. Then, so the child devices are also using, so extending what we had in the examples repository. Um, we're also showing basically all of the features that we can do on child devices. Uh, so for example, the latest one in 10 or 0 0.10 was firmware management. So we have also an example that's the child connector also supports firmware updates. So we just have like a dummy which doesn't really do anything. It just kind of downloads it, it sends a custom event uh, using the Tech API saying, hey, I'm doing something. Uh, and it records, you know, how long it took, for example. Uh, so everything's contained there in the project. Um, and you can see that we also uh, created that when it's trying to install firmware, because let's say that uses a little bit more CPU. So we just kind of generated some dummy, you know, while loop doing some kind of calculation. So we can see here there was a spike in CPU um, while it was doing the firmware update. Just so you can have a little bit more live dynamic uh, demos. Uh, so it's not just ever always a flat curve and everything like that. Um, so I think this will be very useful to a lot of people. Um, and also where we need kind of people's help is if you want to, so you can do a PRs to help, you know, what did you have to do get, to get this set up on your system? So there's a lot of kind of maybe differences um, if you're running on Windows maybe, and if you're not using WSL2 or if you're using Rancher or Docker Desktop, there might be a few kind of, um, integration problems that would love to have documentation with that. Um, so if you've been through the the pain, you know, please create a ticket or something or a PR with a few of instructions, what you had to do to get it running. Uh, and then we can definitely add it to the documentation. Um, so for example, the user guide, which kind of gives us, uh, or gives users a little bit more information, how you can use it, et cetera. So this will be kind of uh, maintained uh, by us. So it always, be when there's new releases, we'll include that in. Um, so we'll build it with the actual release versions. And these are online containers that you can also pull in and into your own Docker file. Uh, so this will be always kind of up to date. 
maybe slightly lag behind the actual releases. Um, however, it's quite easy to also clone it yourself and then pull in the latest releases. So moving on to the refactoring. So I won't mention the actors before because I think I did that enough. Um, so one major kind of side effect that we had by improving uh, or like implementing the actor model is our logging messages got a lot better. So A, the consistency of the log statements because we had a lot more re reusable components. Um, that it's a lot more clear to see what's happening actually in each of the components. So this makes debugging and to kind of like understand and reason with the devices. So maybe if something's not quite working as you think, check out the logs and then you'll see a little bit more information. Ah, what um, MQT messages were sent? Um, was it a REST request sent? And all in one spot. Um, so it really, um, if there's any further improvements, we're also open um for kind of to tweak the messages um and we also with a lot of the error messages um we've also tried to include a lot of context so for example when you do the init command like in this example or if you're trying to um and it maybe can't create a folder it'll always say what folder did it fail creating so you always have that context to so go, oh, I was doing something weird. I deleted this folder manually because I was in my development phase. So it gives you a few kind of like um, hints on how to fix it, um, which is a big improvement to what it was before. Now, part of the releases, we also have uh, included tarballs, which includes all of the binaries within the release. Um, so if you go to like the release page and look under the artifacts, so we already have a lot of artifacts, um, but if you look for the tables, so the tar GZ, you'll see that inside it, they contain each of the binaries so that you can, if you just want the binaries to do whatever you want, whether it's you're building your own Docker images and you don't need the Debian package because maybe you're running on Alpine Linux, uh, then this is a lot more convenient just to get the raw binaries. And then you can integrate that into your CI pipeline or whatever build process you have um, quite easily. And it also uh, enables you to create your own packaging on top. So for example, if you wanted to create your own RPM, package, you can do that because you have the raw binary, so you don't need to build it yourself um, or APK, a APK. So we do have plans to support both of these package managers. So we will get there to support those as well, but it just kind of um, by having the raw binaries it just makes it easier to do any kind of package management that you want in the future. And you don't always have to rely on us to do it first. Um, you can just kind of use the binaries directly. So on the more technical side, um, so looking at the support for using secure MQT brokers. So there's a few different combinations that we can use when setting up an MQT broker. So for starters, uh, our reference implementation is using Mosquito. Um, so all of our kind of auto-generated configuration assumes you're using Mosquito. Um, so if you want to configure your own broker, you can, um, but it obviously relies on a few kind of um, set, um, features like bridges and stuff like that. So at the moment, probably the easiest still uh, way to go is to use Mosquito. Um, but Mosquito has then two different kind of styles of um, securing your broker. You can either specify that the broker should only, uh, so it uses a CA, so a certificate authority, um, where clients can use the CA um, when connecting to the broker to assure, to validate, is it really connecting to the thing it should be connecting to? Um, so to avoid men in the middle attacks, for example, if you have a child device is connecting to um, an external MQC broker, then by having the CA expected CA um, uh, certificate, you can kind of authenticate that 
if someone else has spliced in there and put in a different um, unsecured broker, uh, you'll be able to detect it and then the, the client will then reject the connection. So the, this is probably the easiest um, way to go because it doesn't need then generation of multiple certificates per client. However, it's not the most secure. So it's depending on your scenario, um, this might be useful to you. Um, however, the the real kind of end production use case is having both securing the server side, but also client side authentication as well. So you have a each client will generate its own certificate, and then you can configure that certificate to be used in the MQTT connection from each TED component, and that will make sure that the connection then to the MQTT broker is then secure. So all of these instructions on how to actually do that are listed on our documentation page where it goes into details um, exactly what the configuration is. And then we've also added, if you need a bit of help, how to, let's say, generate your own certificates. If you don't have any kind of PKI set up, um, you can kind of see how that all fits together. But I also want to stress that the goal of FinEdge is not to do everything for you. Um, whilst we want to make the integration easier, by uh, definitely that's the goal. Um, but just because if we haven't implemented something just yet, doesn't mean you can't use all of these tools. Because in, in the end, we are using you know, Mosquito Broker. So you can use whatever settings you want there. And because on the um, Tedge component side, we now support you know, certificate configuration. You can configure it if you want to use it. Um, so it kind of, we don't assume to, we don't want to spoon feed everyone and say, hey, we're going to take over and do it for everyone. Um, it also sometimes requires just looking through Mosquito documentation and saying, hey, how can I use this feature? And then um, the idea is that FinEdge supports the usage of those features. So by that, you can also use your own PKI locally. So for example, um, small step have a pretty good one, so called step-ca um, that you can use to also do kind of local PKI, um, like device registration, which can also issue certificates locally and have all of that kind of nice features. Um, so we're looking to kind of make that integration story easier for users and make that seamless into ThinEdge, but currently that is available now. It just maybe the integration isn't so smooth because you have to do a lot more work yourself. But I just want to stress that there are solutions out there and you don't need to wait on ThinEdge to be able to use these solutions. Um, because ThinEdge, we like to implement and um, kind of easily use interfaces. So it's just use this, you know, set this configuration file, point it to the right file, and then you're good. And yes, because I, I think some people maybe don't know that or are not aware of that. So the idea is that we follow Linux best practices. Um, so integrating with other solutions shouldn't be a problem. So I wanted to give a bit of, or we want to kind of give a glimpse into the future. So now that refactoring is done, we have a bit more capacity to actually do new user facing features. So one of the major ones, um, which will, let's say is not a user facing feature, but has a fairly big user impact, is the current state of how many services do we have? So ThinEdge currently has um, all of these services, which are always running. So with the refactoring, this has actually enabled us to be a little bit more flexible in how we um, mix and match different kind of functionalities. Um, so what we want to do is consolidate a lot of these um, plugins to one single plugin or like group them logically. So we have the mapper, the agent configuration, firmware log. We want to change this so we have a mapper because the mapper doesn't make too much sense because it's technically an optional component. Because if you, have, you write your own mapper that connects to your own cloud, then you can do that. Um, so it still makes sense to have that separately. But then we're looking to combine all of these four plugins into one single binary. 
So where it's more, it's providing a logical device management functionality. So whether that be the configuration firmware log, it's device management. So just being a little bit smarter on the grouping. Um, and it also means that A, it will use less resources. There's less kind of um, integration um, required because it's one service. If you want to restart it, you know, you just have to restart one service rather than, you know, three or four, um, which is a little bit more convenient to use. Um, but the idea is that we still have these plugins maybe available, so you can use them individually if you only want to use configuration plugin. Um, but the idea would be all of the functionality that is delivered by these four are in one single thing. So you can kind of, this will be our default recommended use. Because as you can imagine, if each of the four plugins will have some kind of runtime and minimum memory usage available, we can actually have an even smaller memory footprint and also binary footprint by combining them and reusing some of the um, the code there so it has just um, less resource usage. Then now also the actor model enables us to finally work on some very requested features. I know there's a lot of people, um, especially in the Comlocity space, They've been asking for the firmware operation support and device profiles. So firmware support is the last entity that um, we want to support before we can support the device profiles. Um, because the device profiles, if you're not familiar with the feature, it basically combines, it's an aggregate operation which combines configuration, firmware and software in one operation. So when we support the firmware, um, so we already support it for child devices, but this would be for the main device. So we'd have a plugin like structure similar to maybe the um, software management plugins um, that you can adapt that to any of your firmware kind of strategies, whether it be the Mender standalone mode or SW update or some kind of custom API. Um, the idea is we should be able to integrate with that nicely. And then again, with the actor model will help us out here because we can then reuse the different components. So we already have the firmware, software and configuration, and then we can join it all together in a device profile handler. So there's still a bit of design to be done behind these, so I'm not promising it for the next feature, um, but this is on the, you know, the immediate roadmap that we'll start doing the design um, and then probably do a, a spec document um, and get some feedback on that and then do the implementation. So if you have any kind of existing use cases for firmware or you know of customers saying, ah, oh, this is how people used it or use it personally, um, please feel free to reach out because we always like to validate our designs through real use cases to say, hey, how would that um, usage then fit in with our design? Um, because I think that's in quite important to make sure that we have a good design in the end, which is flexible enough. Um, so please feel uh, feel free to reach out, either create an issue or um, through Teams or Discord, um, whatever medium you prefer. And um, we're more than happy to collaborate and to make sure we have cover your use case. So we're looking also to have a public roadmap um, so everyone has a bit clearer and more transparent idea of what we're doing and what we have planned. Um, so we'll also make an announcement once we have um, the, the details and also a rough sequential kind of step of which features come roughly when, so not on a week by week basis or a month, it'd be more kind of quarter based. Okay, so that concludes the release demo slash explanation. Um, we have 15 minutes still, so I would open up the floor to any questions. Uh, well, thanks for the demo and the update, very nice. Uh, just for the plugin consolidation, did you say that you're going to keep the existing uh, plugins and naming schemes also in the future. So, so are both going to be available? Yeah, I think that's the idea. We haven't 
committed to that just yet. Um, however, I think there's we're we're going in a interesting direction where the boundaries in between this plugin and maybe how can you use it as a child device connector is very blurred. So it might even we we're doing a bit of experimenting or experimenting last week where it might be a little bit flexible how you use these plugins that could be for the main device or a child device. Um, so I think still having the option to have these also individually still makes sense. And for us, there is a little bit of overhead to make sure of the testing. However, the good thing is we already have the testing in place, so we'd be more extending it to support the device management. Technically, we could leave all of the testing in place so we could support both scenarios. So if you need some kind of resolution to say, hey, I want the configuration plugin, but I don't want firmware and log plugin, then you can do that. In the mm -hmm. future, that might be a little bit more dynamic. I don't want to promise anything that, you know, you might be able to opt into features in the same binary. Um, but these are kind of all options we're exploring at the moment. But I think the the pragmatic approach would be, yes, supporting this still individual in addition to this combined plugin. Yeah, OK, so just curious because I mean, the CAY prefix on the current plugin probably means it's Comolosity specific. Y yes, uh, so. But this is part of our goal to also making things more agnostic. Hmm. So. There was also part of our experimentation uh, week last week where we're looking and we are committed to moving all of the logic, which is cloud specific to the mapper. So that would also open up a agnostic MQTT interface to the device management plugin or configuration plugin where we could change that prefix to Tedge configuration plugin. So it is on purpose with C8Y at the moment because it is very commodity specific um, for a few kind of um, actions which are very commodity specific, like the smart risk messages that I have to send out, et cetera. Um, but we're looking to make that agnostic um, so we can fulfill this prefix, which is a much nicer prefix. And it also plays into our agnostic storyline a lot better. Okay. And also and so opens up some. Yeah, sorry. So the mapper would be then the cloud specific part. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Which is our end goal anyway. But don't worry, in, the, in that process, we will not break anything in the backward incompatible way. So that's our promise. Yeah. <laughs> OK, good. good yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then then for the Docker uh, uh, example that you showed, uh, I guess that uses system D, the Docker yeah. compose behind the scenes. OK. Yeah, so at the moment it uses, because what I didn't like about or, or what I got constant feedback is if we require people in the instructions to use it, they need Raspberry Pi or like a systemd environment. That is a little bit of a, a barrier, a pretty high barrier to overcome, um, especially, you know, because Raspberry Pi also had a um, stock issue um, that it was just impossible to buy new devices. Um, so I kind of wanted to eliminate that barrier. But a lot of the plugins in a production environment, if they're not using a containerized deployment environment, they also need to integrate maybe with system D. Um, so I figured as a first step, the idea would be to enable a, it's kind of like a device simulator, simulator environment. So where it allows you to also get familiar with system D if you're not familiar with system D. because so that can also be important if you're doing maintenance on these devices. Um, and you can also do, you know, the general CTL kind of log stuff or play around with a few things. We are interested in also extending this demo to have a container or like a more first class container environment 
where it is one process per container. The only question, um, so I think we have started a, uh, a branch to kind of show this as well, single process containers. Um, however, there's still a bit of finalization needed before that gets pushed. So I think both will exist, and that's why I called it on purpose, system B at the end. Um, but that also leaves us flexible to call it something else. So we can have another image um, next to it. Okay, kind of. Yeah. Because you uh, can run it, you have to do a bit more with um, shared volumes in between the different containers that run. Um, so it is a little bit more setup effort, um, but it's currently doable. Uh, it's just you need to have a bit more experience with you know writing actual container images, because um, that might be a little bit of a challenge for some people. Okay, thank you. And maybe just to highlight with this, um, and maybe a few teasers of other kind of ongoing experiments. Um, this is actually great for using CI CD stuff. So, or even like in the development scenario. So I listed, hey, you know, you can use that in development to test maybe a new plugin. Um, we've been experimenting possibly with some Node Red integration, or how could a Node Red plugin look like? Um, and here, because I wanted to test my plugin would install Node Red plugins via the software management plugin, for example. To actually enable this, uh, it was quite easy. I could create even my custom Docker image where I just pull in from the demo main system D example. And then I do my custom uh, Node Red specific stuff. Because if I want to extend this, because it, we publish the Docker image, so you can actually tailor that to your need. So if you want to, because that includes all things um, thin edge and you can kind of base it on that image and then extend it to your purpose so it fits really nicely into kind of different development processes um, so you can also extend it just because if if there's nothing included there um, that you need to start it it's a you know it's a docker image you can do that with anything so it's very very convenient there um, to extend it to your own custom demos, or if you want to tweak the bootstrapping scripts, I know a few people have already done that, um, to then use um, you know, certificate signing and all that kind of stuff, you can absolutely do that. And it's quite easy to do that. Okay. If any last call for questions? Okay, if not, um, you can always contact us by Discord or uh, create an issue. We're always uh, more than happy to talk to um, people for new requests, new issues, or whatever. Um, and all of the stuff is on GitHub, so you can also create PRs, fork it, and do whatever you want. Um, so we're also more than happy to accept any um, kind of improvements to the current setup. Um, yeah, just fork it and then raise a PR in the normal process. Great, then thanks for joining today and see you next time.